thank you, Scott, for this nice introduction. <laughs> anyway, this is given the, first of all, I want to mention that the title is missing because of the picture, I think, because of, so it should be a relation there. You can see some parts of it there. But this, this uh, article or paper that I will be presenting today is part of a future project that I'm working on. And it has to do basically with how the Moroccan state tries to deal with certain issues, taboos especially, and silences in the Moroccan, in the post-independence Moroccan nation. So I deal with issues like racism or race in general, issues like um, Christianity and uh, Shiaism in Morocco. So a whole range of topics that I'm, I'll put, probably put in as part of a book called, that would probably title, State Rituals, Culture and Society in Morocco. So today's topic deals with soccer, but it actually deals with Algerian-Moroccan relations and how Algerian-Moroccan relations are constructed through soccer and how Hassan II, since independence, tries to use, the, to use soccer as a space through which he would basically um, market or uh, put a certain national agenda regarding the Algerian-Moroccan relations. So, in July 1962, Algeria won a long and bloody war of independence against France. Subsequently, in October 1963, a limited military conflict known as the Algerian-Moroccan Sand War erupted over the southwestern provinces of Tindouf and Colombe Shah. The war began with minor skirmishes around the border before it escalated into fierce fighting for almost a month. After intensive diplomatic negotiations, the Organization of African Unity and the Arab League managed to convince Morocco and Algeria to accept a ceasefire. On February 20, 1964, a peace agreement was signed and a demilitarized zone was instituted. Yet, Moroccan and Algerian hostilities simmered and the testy relationship between these neighbors continued. The sand war has wrought last, lasting political damage on Moroccan re Algerian relations. In 1975, when the Western Sahara conflict erupted, Algeria not only provided its full political and military backing for the Sahrawi independence movement, but it made Tindouf the political base of the Polisarians. You can see here Tindouf right here, and the conflict has been basically around this border. <clears throat> so part of it has already been uh, set up by the, Fr before the, by the French during the colonial period, before the colonial period ended, but the whole problem remains around this, uh, this side. Many observers argued that Moroccan claims were attributed to the discovery of oil and natural resources, such as iron and manganese in the disputed area. Habib Slim, however, saw this emerging rivalry as a geopolitical competition for national dominance in the Arab Maghreb since the first decades of independence. He notes, if they were, not, if they were only Algeria and not Morocco, or Morocco and not Algeria, there could never be a Maghreb. The main power would have swallowed us all up. To have the Maghreb, you need those two rival powers competing with each other in the region. End of quote. Today, the political and military rivalry is entrenched in North African politics, culture, and society. To the extent that it has negatively affected relations between members of the Arab Maghreb Union. In this article, I contend that since June 15, 1972, when King Hassan II and President Hawari Boumedien, and later Ben Bella, signed the agreement recognizing the existing Algerian-Moroccan border, both governments used sport, especially soccer, for, for two key objectives. On the one hand, soccer provided a space to settle political scores. On the other hand, the same space was also used to channel and dispute, Alge and dissipate, sorry, Algerian and Moroccan youth's political antagonism towards their respective governments. I call this phenomena the Janus head of the football carnivalesque, inviting entry to a ritual that may confirm or consume the power of the proprietors. Stadiums were transferred into central locations where Algerian and Moroccan players engaged in shootouts for the imagined nation. 
as rivals held national flags and shouted competing political slogans about, and basically every time you have a game between Morocco and Algeria, these are the types of slogans you see. Algerian inability to gain its independence without Moroccan support, Moroccan betrayal of the Palestinian issue, and Moroccan's occupation of the Western Sahara. By the end of the 1960s, soccer competition became, became a forum of state propaganda as Moroccan and Algerian government turned games into rituals for the celebration of national pride and the collective identity. In his work on ritual, David Kurzer describes how soccer channels political tensions. He argues that soccer is a ritual-like contest where people view international soccer contest as a battle between themselves and other nations. And in this way, ritually ventilate their national chauvinism and their hostilities towards other nations. The use of national sport teams as a symbolic means of international combat is institutionalized in the quadrenn quadrennial Olympics, where nations are pitted against one another in struggle." End of quote. Accordingly, in the context of African and international tournaments, games between Algerian and Moroccan teams have become military contests. This is, uh, even, this is one of the words that Hassan II used many times, and I'll show later with some of the data. The Algerian and Moroccan states wrestled to enforce a strong sense of belonging among their respective communities as they fabricated and enshrined feelings of historical enmity towards each other. In Moroccan politics, the king is symbolic of the nation state. In her work on Moroccan, political, on, on Moroccan politics, Rashida Sherifi describes how the parliament and government are mere collaborators of royal authority, and how key political, social, and economic decisions emanate from the royal institution. A political culture known as Hassanism, or Siasa al Hassaniya, was based on a co opted clientele that maintained its allegiance to the king through fear and greed. And that's what my argument is that you have two layers here. What the king did is that he connected every team, basically on the national level as well as the local level, to military personnel to, and, and to uh, members of the, of the army. And from there also, he connected those teams to the national team. So basically what you have, you have a specific clientele that answers to the kings that is in charge of these, of these soccer teams, both the national team and the regional local teams. So in this post-independence political game, where Moroccan, Moroccan hustled for political alliances centered on the king and other prominent national elite, Hassan II not only set up and enforced political rules despite strong opposition from political parties and the army, and this is its heyday was basically in the late early 1960s all the way to the, uh, the 70s, or what's called in Moroccan as the year of the lead, or Sanawat uh, Rasas in Arabic. Hassan II not only set up and enforced political rules despite strong opposition from political parties and the army, but he became the main political figure to, to the extent that he used sport to make political statements. From the 1960s to mid-1980s, soccer has provided a strong political context for the representation not only of the monarchy, but also for the imagination, invention, and renewed reproduction of the nation state, as Anderson would say. The relationship between soccer and nationalism instead, reach, instead increased, sorry, reaching a climax in the 1970s as political and military tensions between Morocco and Algeria intensified. And this is a quote from one of the critics who have been following, uh, French critics who have been following soccer and the, the policies of Hassan II. The game played an important part in the very definition of what it was to be Moroccan in the modern world, especially in the 1970s and has been a focus of both nationalist agitation and a tool through which modern Moroccan identity has linked to the person of the king and of the monarchy more generally." End of quote. Hassan II was able to transform soccer into a national sport through the militarization of its management. And this is the key ingredient of this, because you link the Western Saharan issue to the Algerian-Moroccan relations, and you, you put the military as part of the whole process. By linking soccer to the military in a strained political environment against Algeria, Hassan II conveyed an image of government power and authority just as African nations began the arduous work of achieving stability, security, and legitimacy in a post-colonial world. This is especially in relation to Algeria as well as Tunisia and even other sub-Saharan and African countries. So soccer